When you live in earthquake country, preparing for the next big one is a part of life. But what happened in Japan on March 11, 2011 is a terrifying reminder that sometimes all the preparation in the world still isn't enough. They were planning for a magnitude eight, you know, maybe an eight three, and they got a magnitude nine, nine one, and it just overwhelmed their coastal defenses. And people were washed off the top of the three-story buildings. The Tohoku quake killed more than 15,000 people. It turned buildings to rubble, leveled entire villages, and triggered tsunamis nearly 50 feet high. Bill Steele is the coordinator for the Pacific Northwest Seismograph Network at the University of Washington in Seattle. According to Steele, Japan was the most earthquake-ready country in the world. The Japanese earthquake was a magnitude 9.0, one of the five largest in the world since 1900. It was something called a megathrust earthquake, a type of quake known for its sheer scale and power. And that's expressed a number of ways. One way is the duration of shaking. So a magnitude 6 might be over in 10 seconds, but a magnitude 9 could take five, six minutes. To put that in perspective, consider the magnitude 7 quake that hit Haiti on January 12, 2010. In less than 60 seconds, Port-au-Prince was nearly toppled to the ground, and more than 233,000 people died. But the Haiti quake wasn't a megathrust, merely what's known as a shallow quake on a crustal fault near the Earth's surface. The famous San Andreas Fault that slices California in two from Cape Mendocino to the Mexican border also produces shallow quakes. And the 6.8 magnitude Nisqually quake that hit Washington state in 2001 wasn't a megathrust either. The other type are the deep earthquakes we have, and there are mom and apple pie events. We get those every 20 to 30 years on average, uh, greater than magnitude six and a half. It's down there about 50, 60 kilometers, maybe 35 miles away from the surface. So that allows a lot of the energy to dissipate. Crustal and deep quakes are common occurrences up and down the West Coast. But megathrust quakes, while rare, are also a threat. And it's the megathrust earthquake that worries scientists and emergency officials the most. Megathrust quakes are distinctive because they happen along something called subduction faults. That's a fault line where instead of two tectonic plates rubbing together, like in both shallow and deep quakes, one tectonic plate actually pushes underneath the other. The subduction fault off the coast of Washington and Oregon is called the Cascadia Zone. The only other confirmed subduction zone in the U.S. is in Alaska. And here in the Pacific Northwest, the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting, or it's converging, coming together with North America. And because this rather thin ocean slab, a very dense rock, meets a continent of thick, lighter rock, it's the one that dives. Pressure between the plates builds up over time, then eventually releases as one plate dives under the other. This leads to a massive geologic upheaval and the birth of a tsunami wave. The seafloor pops up, the water column is lifted, and then it can't support itself and it collapses into a tsunami. Fortunately, megathrust quakes are rare, but the Cascadia Fault could erupt any time. It takes hundreds of years to build up enough strain to break the bond between the rocks and allow that thrust to occur. But when it does strike here, the damage will span the length of much of the West Coast. It's not a point source for magnitude nine. It's a thousand kilometer long polygon. So all of Oregon, all of Washington, Northern California will all be severely impacted. This simulation shows what could happen to an elevated highway like the Alaskan Way Viaduct in Seattle. In addition to the structure crumbling, the ground would likely slide away beneath the cars and turn into a slurry mess. That's due to something called liquefaction. Seattle is built on a lot of sand mixed with water. When the ground shakes, the sand particles compact and the water shoots up. So you have very high pressure water which then will erupt from the ground like big sand volcanoes. It'll actually 
fly up into the air, water and sand, and cover the ground. Up until the 1980s, experts didn't think the Cascadia region was susceptible to megathrust quakes. But then scientists like University of Washington geologist Brian Atwater began suspecting otherwise and set out to prove it by looking for physical clues. At least nine tsunamis have come in here, swept across the, the flats that you can see out there, eaten up a lot of sediment and disgorged it back in the swamps here. Those tsunamis left a written record in sand layers discovered far inland. This is the only sand layer of its kind in a sequence that probably spans the last 400 years. When a megathrust earthquake strikes, the land can drop by five feet or more. Seawater surges across the lowered land, leaving a fresh layer of sand behind. Think of the tsunami wave moving toward Japan. Now imagine that kind of of torrent sweeping across the tide flat that's seaward of us. And then running into this dead end area and slowing down and the debris that was picked up out there falling out of the water and coating the entire landscape. The next step was to find out when the last tsunami swept through the Puget Sound. Dave Yamaguchi is a dendrochronologist, or tree ring analyst, from the University of Washington. He suggested they look to ghost forests for the answer. Trees stand dead in this meadow 130 miles northwest of Seattle because they were drowned by water that flooded inland by almost a mile during the past giant quake. The trees died, but their stumps left behind a natural archive. It's thought that the lowering of the landscape at the time of the deposition of the, of the, of the sand layer is what, what killed the trees. By dating the final ring on one of these trees, Yamaguchi determined that the last giant quake in the Pacific Northwest happened in January of 1700. It's important for us now to know how, how big the earthquakes in the past have been in this region because the past tells us what can happen in the future. All right. Let's do it. Let's be off. Surprisingly, recent discoveries of very small earthquakes on the Olympic Peninsula may offer clues about when the next megathrust might hit. So we're here at this site to measure uh, the very, very weak tremors that we get with these events that happen every 15 months. University of Washington geophysicist Ken Krieger is measuring northwest tremors so subtle that until recently, no one even knew they were happening. It doesn't cause anything that anybody feels. It doesn't cause anything that even anybody even knew what it was until very recently. These events are called slow slip. Basically, it's one long, low-frequency earthquake that lasts between 30 and 40 days. Ah. And because they are spread over so much time, the damage hasn't been noticed until recently. But overall, these very slow shifts release a startling amount of energy. Awesome. We have these magnitude 6.5 to 6.8 earthquakes every 15 months, almost like clockwork. Seismometers are used to measure the slowly shifting plates. Krieger and his team use a stomp test to help calibrate the seismometer. And do the north-south channel. Wow. This is as nice a test as I've ever seen. Prior to 10 years ago, scientists thought these disturbances were just noise. But now we know they are much more important. There's reason to think that the next megathrust will be triggered by one of these slow slip events. What we have gotten good at is knowing where earthquakes will occur in the future, how big they can get, okay, the kind of ground motion that they will produce, and then give a probability of that happening, say, in the lifetime of a building. In other words, now that we know a magnitude 9 quake is possible, we can engineer our structures to withstand that kind of force. We can save billions of dollars, potentially economically, as well as save lives. Unfortunately, experts say cities and communities along the west coast of the U.S. are far less prepared than Japan, which maintains stricter building codes and practiced evacuation drills much more frequently than is common in the U.S. The problem is money. 
Retrofit projects like the redesign of Seattle's 520 floating bridge crossing Lake Washington have been stalled for years by state budget restraints. However, finding those dollars may save lives. We have good plans, we have good designs. We need to invest some resources to give people safe, viable options to save themselves in the event of an earthquake. And if we wait until after they're washed away, that would be the worst tragedy.